Oh, hi, I'm Ms. Bond. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm a sixth grade math teacher at Mercer Middle School, and I'm so excited to teach you some math today. For this lesson, you will need a piece of paper or a notebook and something to write with. We know everything seems weird and different right now, but your teachers are working really hard to give you some lessons for TV learning and online learning. It's important that even though we are staying home for the time being, hashtag quarantine, hashtag flatten the curve, we still have goals and routines. So now that you have your something to write with and hopefully a piece of paper, maybe a tablet, maybe a notebook, we're going to write down some goals. I want you to write one or two things you want to do this week and schedule a time. Clearly you're here working on some math with me right now. Amazing. So awesome. Are you going to tune in again tomorrow? Are you going to read a new book tonight? Get your paper and something to write with. I got my stylus. Use the following sentence then. At time on day, I am going to blank. So for me, at maybe at like 4 p.m. today, I am going to answer questions on video chat with my students. What are you going to do today, tomorrow, something that you're going to do this week? Schedule it in so that you're creating a little routine for yourself. One of my other main goals during this quarantine is to stop ordering out with Uber Eats so much and to cook some more. So we're going to do a lesson on fractions and cooking because this is something that you could do at home and it also uses some of your great sixth grade math skills. I'm lucky to have an amazing sister who's also a baker so I don't bake that often. And baking is kind of an exact science where you need to really measure things correctly otherwise your cookies turn out weird. So we're going to look at a chocolate chip cookie recipe and we're going to think about how fractions make a big part of baking. Before we get started, check out this little picture that shows how changing ingredients can change your cookie. So if you add a little bit of extra something or you change up what kind of sugar you're using, it's going to make a different texture of cookie. And this is all just your personal preferences. So if you want a more doughy cookie, you would use more flour. If you wanted a cake-like texture, you would use um, baking powder only. If you refrigerate the dough, different things happen. So this is almost like a little bit of science where if you change some of the ingredients, you get a different result. So if you have some time, check this out, look it up, and make some cookies on your own. Today we're going to imagine that I'm cooking cookies for all of my sixth graders. So we're going to imagine I need 120 cookies because I have about 120 sixth graders. And no, that is not all of the sixth graders at my school. We actually have around 400 total sixth graders. So. We'll get to that kind of problem later. For now, we're just gonna think of my 120 students who I miss so much. So taking a look at this recipe, this recipe will make enough cookies for 45 people, for 45 cookies. So if I'm using this recipe and I wanna make sure that all of my sixth graders get at least one cookie, I might give an extra to my favorite student or something, you know who you are. We need to figure out how many batches we need to make. So, 45 cookies, 120 students, let's just use some estimating. Probably need around 3 batches because 45 times 3 is 135. So I'll have a few extra because I have a lot of favorites out there. Looking at this recipe, we are just going to analyze the flour. So we need two and three fourths cups of flour for one batch of cookies. So if I'm going to triple this recipe, I need to figure out how many scoops of each thing I need. So let's get started. So a three fourths cup measuring cup 
doesn't exist. But I have my half cup, I have my quarter cup, one fourth cup, and oh, I forgot to get my whole cup. So I'll go grab my whole cup and then we're gonna get started. So I want you to start thinking about the different types of scoops I could make if I want to triple two and three fourths cups of flour. Okay, so I have my whole cup. So tripling that two is pretty easy. So I'm gonna take two and triple it. So I need six, so six whole cups of flour. to triple the three-fourths cup. So if I just think of three-fourths, it's three of these. So I could go one, two, three. But I have to do that three times. So, all right, that was once. Here we go again. One, two, Okay, that was twice. I gotta do it again. One, two, three. Oh, man, that was so tiring. I really need to figure out a faster way to get all the scoops because I'm going to have to triple everything on this recipe and it takes a while to go back and forth all the time. So I want you to think about how could I have done that differently? What combinations of measuring cups could I have used to do that a little bit faster? Let's take a break from the cookies for a moment and think about measuring cups in a different way. So there's estimation 180. Estimation 180 has some great thinking problems about numbers and about math problems. And one of the problems they had uses a measuring cup. So they're using a 1 fourth cup. So I want you to look at this picture and estimate how many pieces of candy corn you think fit into that one fourth measuring cup. They show you a picture of a candy corn on the counter and they show you a clear one, luckily, because you can't see through this one, to kind of figure out how many pieces of candy corn are in that measuring cup. And it's important that we're not just guessing because there is some math reasoning that we can do. How can you use that piece of candy corn that's on the counter to figure out how many pieces of candy corn are in the cup? How can you use the number of candy corn that you can see through the clear cover to figure out how many are in the cup? Because that understanding of why and that ability to explain is the important part. It's not important to just get the right answer, but it's important to understand why. So on your piece of paper, write down estimation 180, and then think about how many pieces of candy corn are in this measuring cup and why. So writing this down, I think there are blank pieces of candy corn because, and I want you to really think about why, you can try this with a sibling, a family member. There's lots of problems on estimation180.com and you can do this on your own. When we multiply the 3 fourths by 10, we get 30 over 4. So that means I have to take my 1 fourth cup scooper and scoop it 30 times because this is the 1 fourth. 30 of 1 fourth cup. Or I can start putting things together because there are 4 fourths in a whole. So how many fourths fit into 30? So that would be 7. And then I have 2 fourths that are just leftover pieces. So 7 whole cups and 2 more scoops of this. Or I could simplify 2 fourths equals 1 half. And I could just use my half scooper. And then I don't even need this little fourth scooper. The fastest way to multiply fractions and mixed numbers is to turn our mixed number, two and three fourths, 
So we have 2 and 3 fourths, that's a mixed number because it has a whole number and a fraction. We're going to turn that into an improper fraction. We're just going to combine them right at the beginning so then we don't have that step of adding at the end. So that it just makes one number and we're taking that whole number and multiplying it by 10. So 2 times 4 is 8 plus 3 is 11. So we get 11 over 4. We're going to take 11 fourths and multiply that by 10. Remember that denominator is just showing us the size of the piece, so we don't have to multiply that by anything. So we're just going to keep it as 4 on the bottom. The top is where we have to do 11 times 10, which is 110. Some of you might know how to cross cancel. If you don't, don't worry about it. But because I can cross cancel, I can simplify this a little bit. So this would be 55 over 2. And then I'm trying to figure out, okay, how many times does 55 go into 2? If I'm not sure, then I'm going to do some long division. And I get the same thing as I did before, 27 and 1 half cups of flour. Before we get back to practicing more math, I want you to look at this picture. I want you to think about, with these four measuring cups, which one doesn't belong? And there could be lots of answers. So I want you to think which one doesn't belong and why. And I want you to think of all the answers you could think of. So this one doesn't belong because blank. You got that one, think of another one. This one doesn't belong because blank. So remember that question we talked about earlier about if I were to make cookies for all of the sixth graders at Mercer? I want us to start thinking about those kinds of problems because if you were to ever have a business, a bakery for example, you're not just going to make one batch of cookies, you're going to make tons of batches of cookies lots of batches of cookies and so we have to use our fraction reasoning our number reasoning to figure out how much of each ingredient we would use because we don't want messed up cookies so at mercer we have around 400 sixth graders and yes that is just the sixth grade so i don't even want to think about trying to make cookies for the entire school so Looking at our recipe, I want you to figure out how many batches of cookies I would need to make cookies for all of the 6th graders. Hopefully you've been able to figure out we need around 9. 10 batches would make 450, so 9 would get me close. Because we're estimating, I'm just going to use 10 because we all could use a little bit of extra cookies in our lives. If one batch needs two and three fourths cups of flour, and remember if I add extra flour then I get weird looking cookies that are like barely cooked. So I want to make sure that I make a nice normal looking cookie. I cannot round the amount of flour. So I need ten times the two and three fourths cups. So I would want to scoop the two cups 10 times, can do that, but then I don't want to scoop this 10 times, so I need to multiply this times 10, and then times 3, because this is only 1 fourth cup, and I need 3 fourths of a cup, so 10 times 3 fourths. We can add that together. And then we can figure out how many cups total so that I'm not scooping randomly and I'm not having to count this so many times. We could also take two and three fourths instead of multiplying each of them separately. We can also multiply, uh, turn the two and three fourths into a mixed number and multiply that way. So pick a method to multiply the number of chocolate chips by 10, pick 
pick a method to multiply the amount of sugar by 10. So now I want to take all of the ingredients and multiply all of them by 10 because I wouldn't just multiply the flour by 10 and leave everything else alone. And some of these ingredients are going to be an easy multiplication problem. One cup of unsalted butter times 10 is going to be 10 cups of butter. One and one fourth, that's one of those problems that you have multiple ways of solving. If you want to take the whole number, multiply that by 10, and then take the quarter cup, multiply that by 10, that's kind of an easy way to estimate. So 1 times 10 is obviously 10, and then 10 times 1 fourth, because it's just 1 fourth, that's 10 fourths. And then we would have to simplify in order to figure out how much brown sugar we would need. So to simplify that, we're going to take 10 fourths and turn that back into a mixed number so that's 2 and 2 fourths or 2 and 1 half and so that would be 12 and a half cups of brown sugar. Moving on to the sugar, regular sugar, not brown sugar, we're going to take 1 half times 10. So 1 half times 10 is 10 over 2, which is 5 cups of sugar. We already did the flour. We got 27 and a half cups from before. Now I want you to try to multiply all of the rest of the numbers by 10 on your paper. So you're going to write down 1 and 1 half times 10, solve that one, 2 times 10, oh nice, 1 times 10, 3 fourths times 10, and then 1 and 3 fourths times 10. So solve those on your paper when you have a free moment and we're going to keep on doing a different activity. Now that we've thought of fractions, I want us to switch gears and think about decimals. When we buy things at the store, we're using decimal skills all the time. So decimals are going to be really important as we get into life and buy our things, all that kind of stuff. So looking at our ingredients list, we had chocolate chips, we had flour, we had sugar, we have all these things with different prices. And so going back to that problem about buying enough ingredients to get each sixth grader at Mercer a cookie at least. So I want you to think about using the prices on the screen to figure out how much it's going to cost to buy all of this stuff. So let's figure that out together. To find how much things cost, we have to look at how much we need. So there's always going to be different amounts that we might need in order to have enough. I'm going to pretend like I have the other ingredients and the ingredients I need are flour, chocolate chips, brown sugar, and sugar. I don't bake a lot, so these are just things that I don't have. So for the flour, we need 27 cups. So looking at that package, looking at this package, I don't think I could get 27 cups out of this. I'd rather have extra rather than have to go back to the store because right now that is truly an adventure. So I want to get three pounds, three five pound bags, so three bags. So the first thing that we're going to do is find the prices. So three bags of flour. If it's $3.39 for each bag, I could take $3.39, I could add it three times. It's going to cost $10.17 for those three bags. Let's try it with multiplication. So on your paper, writing this down, we have three bags 
but each costs three dollars and thirty nine cents. So I'm going to take my three dollars and thirty nine cents, multiply it by three. So I want to start on the one, uh, smallest place value. And then you should look at your answer and be like, $1,017 is way too big. So I need to figure out, okay, what step did I miss? Clearly my decimal, I forgot about my decimal. So remembering that our decimal place values carry through because if I had tenths and hundredths in the multiplication, I'm going to have some tenths and hundredths in my answer. So remove our decimal to fit those place values in and we get the same answer. So we're going to use multiplication to solve the rest of these problems as a little bit of review. So our chocolate chips are $3.39 again, but I need five bags this time. So write this problem on your paper. And I want you to solve that one on your own and I'll get you the answers at the end. Same thing with the cane sugar. I'll go through this with, with you. Three bags. Three times nine is 27, carry that 2, 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2, 8, 3 times 3 is 9. Moving our decimal 2 times, $9.87. And then for this one, we just needed the one back, so $3.49. Going back to that problem I had you do on your own, we'll do it together if you haven't gotten there. 9 times 5 is 45. 3 times 5, 15, plus 4, 19, 3 times 5 is 15 again, plus 1, 16. And since we have money math, we'll have two decimal places. So now I have all four prices. The flour costs $10.17, the chocolate chips cost $16.95, the brown sugar costs $9.87 and the sugar costs $3.49. I want to add those all together. Remember, when we add things together, we want to make sure our place values are lined up. In dollars get added to dollars, the cents get added to cents. So, stacking all of this up. And then starting at the smallest place value in order to add. This is a lot to add. I don't think I want to add all of this all together right away. I'm just going to do two at a time. So I'm going to add the flour and the chocolate chip cookies. 7 plus 5. Carrying our bigger place values and bringing our decimal down. Remember, we only move the decimal for division and multiplication because the place values have to be distributed. For adding, we just bring them down, it just holds their place value the same. And then I want you to finish the problem. I'll do one more as an example. Finish this problem adding on the amount of sugar. Remember, food items are not taxed, so this would be your grand total at the store. A fun activity to practice any of your decimal math at home is to just look through things that are probably junk mail that you could find some numbers and some percents. Thank you so much for watching this math lesson. I hope you learned about multiplying fractions and decimals today and how to think about fractions when you're cooking. Feel free to use the recipe over break. I'll leave it on the screen so you can see it and you can write this down. Other resources that are available are in your Pearson textbook in volume one. You can practice fractions on page 19 to 24, or you can look online on pearsonrealize.com. If you know how to log in, there is an online version of the textbook there. You can also reach out to your teacher. They're available to help you, and I'm sure they would love to hear from you over break. So reach out to them on email if you have any other questions. 
let's finish off by looking at the thing that you wanted to do this week. Remember that sentence stem? At time, on day, I'm going to blank. So hopefully you were able to fill that in. If you haven't, you can fill that in now on your paper. Try to keep yourself to that goal. Give yourself a smiley face or check mark when you finish it and write another one. If you have a little planner, if you have a little list of things to do, it keeps us feeling like things are normal and everything's going to be okay. So I hope you're all doing well. We're going to get through this together. So thanks for tuning in.